And uh, I'm looking forward to what the Lord has for us. We're going to be in 1 Kings this morning in the 21st chapter. 1 Kings chapter number 21. I'm going to carry this microphone around. It helps my throat a little bit. I was doing this one place. This fellow said to me, he said, you look like Jimmy Swaggart when you carry that mic around. And I said, I wouldn't know. I've never watched Jimmy Swaggart, so... So if I do, if, you, if you'll look past that, I'll appreciate it. I'm going to read a few verses just to begin with, and then uh, we'll look at this uh, several things in this chapter. I want to start in verse number 25 of 1 Kings 21. The Bible said, But there was none like unto Ahab which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols, according to all things as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Now what we've just read in these few verses is the tail end of a sermon that Elijah has preached to Ahab. And I want you to see what happens when the sermon is finished. Verse 27. And it came to pass when Ahab heard those words that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. I want to use these verses for a little while, and I tried to think about a title for this sermon. I think I'm going to call it, Did You See That? Did you see that? Let's pray. Father, we love you today. Thank you for loving us first. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, thank you we can be assembled together with the saints of God. No place, Lord, we would rather be than here to worship you together. And I pray you be glorified in the sermon. I thank you, Lord, for what's happened already, what's been said, what my heart has felt. But, Lord, I know this. If you're glorified, then your people will be helped. So get glory under your name today. And, Lord, help your people. And I pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. When we come to 1 Kings chapter number 21, I think probably if you've been around church very long, you're familiar with what took place in the beginning of this chapter. There is a king named Ahab. Let me read you a couple verses. Verse 1, And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard that I may have it for a garden of herbs because it is near unto my house and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it or if it seem good to thee I will give thee the worth of it in money and Naboth said to Ahab the Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee now when Ahab heard Naboth's response he went home and fell down on his bed and began to pout like a child I remember years ago some of you that have little children will remember this we used to my my family traveled with me all the time They do most of the time now, but the girls are grown. But when they were little, we had to travel sometimes as long as 17 hours in a pickup truck with little girls. And so we listened to a lot of Patch the Pirate. How many remember Patch the Pirate? Some of you do. I I remember I've been kidnapped on island. I've been to outer space. Patch the Pirate goes west. But I remember a song on that, I believe it was kidnapped on island, called uh, the Poochie Lip Disease. My girls used to sing that in church sometimes. Time. That's what Ahab gets. He gets the poochy lip disease. He gets mad and angry, and so he goes in and throws himself across the bed, and his wife Jezebel comes in. She wants to know what's wrong with him. He said, well, I wanted Naboth's vineyard, and I offered him a good deal, but he turned me down, and then she asked him this question. It's an interesting question. She said, dost thou reign in Israel? Really what she was saying is, I'm the one in charge here. I'll get it for you. And so she did, and she, she wrote some letters 
years and she had some wicked men take Naboth, put him up on high and make some accusations against him. They said, well, he's blasphemed God. He's blasphemed the king. And so they ended up stoning Naboth. And when they were done with that, Jezebel said, Naboth is dead. Go get what you want. So uh, Ahab went down and he took that vineyard that he'd been wanting. But you know, they thought they got away with it. They thought they were slick. They thought they were careful. They thought they'd covered it up. They thought they had it all figured out, but they forgot God. And God knew what had happened. God knew what had gone on. And so God said to his prophet Elijah, I want you to go down and preach a sermon to Ahab. And he begins that sermon down in about verse number 19. And he says to him, he has, says, thou hast killed and taken possession. And then he said this, in the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine, verse 19. And he begins to preach to him and pronounce judgment on this man Ahab. He tells him his children are going to be destroyed. He tells him his wife, the blood of his wife will be licked up by the dogs. And he said uh, in verse 24, him that dieth of Ahab in the city the dogs shall eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. And so he tells him judgment is coming. He pronounces judgment. We've already heard about judgment in the Sunday school hour. But he talks about the judgment of God upon the house of Ahab. But somehow this man, the Bible said, when he heard of the judgment of God, humbled himself. Now, I want to talk to you about that for a moment. Brother Dale, our dear brother, has already preached on this a little bit. I want to talk to you about three things in this passage. If you'll fall, stay with me, I'll not be long this morning. I want you to notice, first of all, the magnitude of Ahab's rebellion the magnitude of his rebellion. Look with me in our text in verse number 25. First, God will mention his standing. He said, but there was none like unto Ahab. When God looked and said, if you want to see a sinner, look at Ahab. If you want to see wickedness, look at Ahab. There's nobody that measures up to him as far as wickedness and ungodliness. I was reminded when I read that, God said about Job when he's talking to Satan, he said, hast thou considered my servant Job that there's none like him, a perfect man, upright, feareth God, escheweth evil. And so God said, if you're looking for somebody holy, if you're looking for somebody godly, uh, go ahead, take a look at Job. There's none like him. But he said, if you're looking for somebody wicked, if you're looking for somebody that's ungodly, if you're looking for somebody that's unrighteous, if you're looking for somebody like that, look at Ahab. In his standing, there is none like him. I'm going to tell you, we're seeing wickedness today that I never dreamed of when I was a child. We're seeing wickedness in America that we never even considered. I mean, we when I was a boy, there were things going on, but I'm telling you, there's things going on in America now that I never dreamed of. I, 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 I just can't imagine some of the things that are taking place, and it seemed like every day there's more and more. The standing of this man, Ahab, he is as wicked as they come. I want you to notice not only his standing, but notice his selling. He said, but there was none like unto Ahab which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. Now think about what God just said. Ahab's just not a wicked man. He has sold himself to work wickedness. Now you think about this. If I own something, I'll do with it what I want. But if I sell it to you, it becomes yours and you do with it what you want. Here's what Ahab did. He took his life and sold it to wickedness wickedness, sold it to perverseness, and now wickedness will have its way in the life of Ahab. I'm reminded the Bible tells us, Paul said to those that church in Corinth, what, know you not your body's a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you which you have of God, and you're not your own, you're bought with a price. Wherefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You and I that are saved have been purchased. We've been bought by the blood of Christ, and we are to live according to his desires. Well, here's what this man did. He sold himself to wickedness, and wickedness will have its way with him. Not only his standing and his selling, but notice his stirring in our text. But there was none like unto Ahab which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. Now watch this. Whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. I'm going to tell you the Bible said, who can find a virtuous woman? 
Her, her value is high, far above rubies. But you talk about a wicked woman. You listen to me now. Isn't it good when there is a home and the husband and the wife are in agreement that their purpose is to serve God? Amen. Boy, that's a good thing. When the Bible said, whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing, I tell you, 43 years ago, I found a good thing. I found a woman who is virtuous. I found a woman who feareth the Lord. Beauty is uh, vain and, uh, 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 and or beauty is vain and favor is deceitful, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. And I found a woman that fears the Lord. And what a godly woman she's been. And you know what she's done for 43 years? She has stirred me up to godliness. She has stirred me up to live for God. She has she has been uh, alongside of me and said, let's do this for God. You know, I, I, we celebrated, we'll celebrate 43 years this year, but for 40 years of the 43 years we've been, uh, well, 42 years now, we've been preaching. And for 30 years, preacher, for 30 years, we lived together married for 30 years before we ever lived in a home that didn't have wheels under it. 30 years in a motor home or a fifth wheel trailer or whatever, a home that had wheels under it. After 30 years, we finally got us a home that doesn't have wheels under it. But you know, not one time did my wife ever say, I wish we'd settle down somewhere and stay. Not one time did she ever say, did she ever say, you know, I wish we wouldn't do this. You know what she always said? Let's do what God wants us to do. Let's go, oh, thank God for a godly woman. But here is a woman that is wicked and ungodly and she stirs her husband up to iniquity there is his standing hey can I stop and say this sir if you got a godly wife then you better thank God you better thank God for her. And if you don't have a godly wife pray for her pray for her bring her along nourish her love her bring her along help her to grow there's the standing the selling the stirring and then here's this there's the stinking of Ahab now watch in verse 26 and he did very abominably in following idols. Now, that's an unusual phraseology there. I read in my Bible about what are abominations in the sight of the Lord. And there are several of them in the Bible. It is an abomination. And if you study the word abomination, it means a stench. You know, when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, the Bible said, I think it's Ephesians chapter, uh, it may be three, maybe it's in Ephesians somewhere, where the Bible said that he offered himself up a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord. And all through the Old Testament, God is, is, is uh, described to us as having nostrils. He said, I'll not smell in your solemn feast. In Isaiah 53, the Bible said it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That word bruise is the term of a pharmacist who would take the mortar and the pestle and Put the, put the uh, medicine in and whatever it was there, whatever ingredients, and then he would grind it to powder, and as he ground it, there would be a sweet-smelling savor come up. And when Jesus was bruised on the cross of Calvary, God the Father leaned over the battlements of heaven and said, Oh, that smells good. Oh, that's a pleasant aroma. Oh, that's wonderful. I, when, it, when he did that on the cross of Calvary, it was pleasant in the nostrils of God. But in the Old Testament, when it talks about an abomination, it's talking about something that is a stench, something that if you get near it and get a whiff of it, it'll turn your stomach. But the Bible does not say that Ahab was just an abomination. It didn't say he just committed abomination. It said very abominably up in Indiana, at my pastor's house, they were gone away for about a week, and while they were gone, the electric went out. And when the electric went out, it was out for several days, and the freezer, everything in the freezer thawed. And they came home and opened up that freezer, and all that meat was spoiled in there. And it's, it was a stench. And their daughter, their grandson did not know what had happened, but the daughter knew. And so when the grandson, Garrett, came over, the daughter, Jennifer, said, Garrett, would you go out and get me something out of the freezer? So he went out there not knowing what was going on and lifted up the top of that freezer and just about passed out from the stench in there. When God looked at this man Ahab and thought about his life, here's what he said. He stinks in my nostrils. He's a stench. His wickedness, his ungodliness, that's the magnitude of Ahab's rebellion. But I want you to notice something else. I want you to notice the measure of Ahab's repentance. 
Because Ahab, in a measure, repents when he hears what God has to say through the prophet. Now watch what it says in verse 27. And it came to pass when Ahab heard these words. Now here's the first thing I want you to notice. Ahab heard these words. That's a miracle in itself. That's a wonder in itself that Ahab would listen to what the man of God had to say. Somebody said, preacher, I want America to get right. I want to get right. Well, I tell you what, I want America to get right, but let's narrow it down a little bit. Let you and I get right with God. Let you and I humble ourselves. You say, oh, preacher, how does it start? It starts by hearing the word of God. It starts by listening to what the man of God said. It starts by listening to what the Holy Ghost says to us in the word of God. I tell you, thank God that somebody's interested this morning in what the word of God has to say. He heard the word of God. Then notice what happened. It said, and it came to pass when Ahab heard these words that he rent his clothes. It's supposed to be in the Old Testament. When you rent your clothes, it was supposed to be an outward manifestation of what was going on in your heart. Your heart was rent, and so you rent your clothes as an outward manifestation of what was supposed to be going on in the inside. Then the Bible said he put sackcloth upon his flesh. Uh, he afflicted himself. He fasted. He lay in sackcloth. And then I like this little phrase, and went softly. So, preacher, what does that mean? Well, you, if you're a parent, you know what it means. Did you, ever, did you ever correct a child and they didn't talk back to you, but when they went out, they slammed the door? They were letting you know they didn't agree with what you had to say. Or they didn't talk back directly to you, but they went. <laughs> and then they walked outside and spoke to someone else. They weren't walking softly. Here's Ahab. God said judgment is upon your family and your house. Ahab rends his clothes. He puts on sackcloth. He fasts. He fasts. And then here's what he does. Everywhere he goes, he walks softly. He doesn't say, God shouldn't be doing this to me. I don't deserve this kind of stuff. I'm not as bad as all that. He never said any of that. He's walking softly. He understands he's getting exactly what he deserves. He's walking softly. Now you say, well, preacher, Ahab repented in a measure. I'm afraid his repentance was not complete. He went through these motions. He rent his clothes. He put on sackcloth. He fasted. He walked softly. But here's what he didn't do. He, he didn't give the vineyard back. You remember when Zacchaeus got right with God? He said, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've taken anything from any man wrongly, I restore him fourfold. You see, there's something lacking in this repentance. There's a lot of outward manifestation, but there's no real action. He didn't give the vineyard back. I don't read about it anywhere. I'll tell you what else he do. He did not rebuke his wife. He did not speak to Jezebel and say, you know, we shouldn't have done this. It was wrong. He did not do that. You know what else he did not do? He did not abandon his idolatry. Because we'll find him in the next chapter and Jehoshaphat comes and they're going to go to battle together. And so Jehoshaphat says, get us some men of God. Get us some prophets so we can find out whether we ought to go to battle or not. And so Ahab calls in the prophets of the groves, the idolatrous prophets. And the reason he calls them in is because they're going to agree with everything he says. And when Jehoshaphat hears what these men say, he said, no, nah, something ain't right here. Something's not right. He said, ain't there a man of God around here? Isn't there somebody from God? God around here that can talk to us? Can't we hear from somebody else? And here's what Ahab said. He said, well, there's one, but he said, I hate him. And I'll tell you why I hate him. He never speaks good to me. He never says, I'm all right. He never, he never pats me on the back. He never said, well, you're a pretty good fellow, Ahab. He said, I don't want to hear from him. What's the problem with Ahab? He has worldly sorrow, but not godly sorrow. 
Paul talked to us in the New Testament. He said, Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Here's the problem with Ahab. He sees the judgment of God, and he does not want to experience the judgment of God. And so he does the best he can to try and humble himself, but he's unwilling to turn from his sin. He's unwilling to finish his repentance. He's sorry he got caught, but he's not sorry about what he did. I remember some years ago, Brother Jack Tripp was preaching a meeting with me, and he said this. I'll never forget it. He said, people say to me, preacher, how do I know if I really repented? He said, here's how you know. If you ever really repented, you're still repenting. If you ever really started, you're finishing it. You're going on with it. It's none of this, none of this one time day. I felt a little bad about it. Here is a man. His repentance was not complete. And yet, and yet, look what happened. Now listen to me. I'm about done. Listen to me, please. Verse 29. Here is a man who did not completely repent. His repentance was incomplete. But he did humble himself. And look what happened. Verse 29. God speaks to Elijah. I I would like to have heard this conversation. God says to Elijah, did you see that? You know, there's not many things I think I think that would get that kind of response out of God because he knows the beginning from the ending. And yet God looked at Ahab and said, did you see that? Elijah, seest thou? I, 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 I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about this. I take a note. I, I take notice a note of surprise in the voice of God. Uh, and incred- he's incredulous a little bit about this. I know he knows everything, but I'm looking at it. He said, Elijah, did you see what happened? Did you see what Ahab did? Did you see that? I want you to notice that the humbling even of a wicked man who is alone in his standing, who is stirred up by his wife, who has sold himself to wickedness, even that man, when he humbled himself, he got the attention of Almighty God so that God said, did you see that? Did you see what he did? Did you see? Oh, dear friend, would you think about it a moment if a man like Ahab, who is unwilling to completely repent, will humble himself? himself and get the attention of God. I wonder what would happen if people all over the place that love God would humble themselves and say, Lord, I'm turning from my sin. I'm turning from my wickedness. I wonder what we get from God. Here's the third thing I want to say to you. I want to talk to you about the mercy in God's reprieve. Because you know what the definition of mercy is? It's the withholding of deserved punishment. I used to say it like this, two great words in our Bible, grace and mercy. Grace is when I get what I don't deserve, and mercy is when I don't get what I do deserve. The withholding of deserved punishment. And so here is Ahab. Judgment has been placed upon his house. He is under the judgment of God. But when he humbles himself, that's all he did. He humbled himself. Basically, he said, Lord, you're right and I'm wrong. He humbled himself. And when he did, God gave him a reprieve. God said this. He knew it. He knew his repentance wasn't complete. He knew that, but he saw that humbled heart. He saw that humbled humbled man and he said this he said uh, I will not bring the evil in his days but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house he got a reprieve because he humbled himself now this brings to my mind three things I'm going to give them to you first of all it tells me that God sets great store by his mercy God sets great store by his mercy. You know what the Old Testament prophet said? He said of God, he delighteth in mercy. (laughs) Is there anything in your life that delights you? I think golfing must delight the preacher. Maybe not anymore. But, you know, I always thought golfing was a sin if you could have went fishing. 
There's something about the fishing. I, my family, we go fishing, and I, I go up to the Upper Peninsula every year where I used to pastor. There's a lot of things go on. The young people we used to pastor, they're all grown and married and have kids, and they'll meet us down for a bonfire every night. We have a time. But we're going up there to catch walleye so we can have it. That's our Thanksgiving dinner at walleye. There's something about throwing that thing out there and lifting that jig up off the bottom of that uh, lake and all of a sudden feeling that weight on there. There's just something about it. I delight in it. I enjoy it. I look forward to it. I make plans to get to do it. I only get to do it about once a year, but I look forward to it. You know what I think about mercy? I think God delights in it. I think he looks forward to it. I think he makes plans to get involved with it. He delighteth in mercy, so much so that another prophet said in wrath, remember mercy, his mercies. Thank God for a merciful God. I look at this and I say to myself, God must love mercy if he'll show mercy to a man like him. Ahab, think what God would do if we'd humble ourselves this morning. Think what God might do if you and I would get on our knees and say, Lord, you're right and I'm wrong. I haven't been what I'm supposed to be. You've always been what you promised, but I've come short. Lord, I'm sorry. Wonder what God would do this morning if we'd humble ourselves. He loves to be merciful. God shows mercy to everyone that fears him. Ahab must have feared him, else why would he have done what he did? His repentance was not complete, but at least he feared God. In our Bible, I wrote this first down, as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Do you fear him today? Do you recognize his omnipotence and his omniscience and his omnipresence? Do you recognize he's a sovereign God? Do you recognize you're answerable to him? You say, preacher, I don't know exactly how to get right. Well, let me tell you what a good start would be. A good start would be on your knees, humbling yourself before God, saying, Lord, I've been wrong. I don't know how to make it right but I want to be right with you. He'll have mercy on them that fear him. Huh. Here's the last thing. God saves the truly repentant for eternity because of his mercy. You know what Ahab got? He got a reprieve. You know what I got? I got regeneration. You know what I have got? And extending for a little while. You know what I got when I repented? I got eternal life. I'm going to live as God as long as God lives. I'm going to live in heaven with Jesus forever. Oh, friend, think about the mercy of God. Think about the mercy of God. Matthew Henry said this. I won't argue with Matthew Henry. He's a lot smarter than I am. But Matthew Henry said this. He said it's as though God would let you question his justice and question his holiness, but he won't let you question his mercy. He won't let you get away with that. He will not. He, he defends his mercy and he's shown in the life of Ahab. I'm saying to you this morning, there's no telling what God would do if we'd humble ourselves. I was preaching to a group of teenagers the other day. My text was from Hebrews and I was preaching about Esau who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And afterward, he found no place of repentance, though he sought it bitterly with tears, carefully with tears. That word afterward got a hold of me. I looked it up, and it's a compound word, and it means coming after and in order. And what, what the Hebrew writer was saying was what's hap what happened in Ahab's life came after the decision he made, and it came in order. In other words, nothing else could happen because of the decision that he made. And I was trying to teach those young people that Every decision you make has an afterword with it. Now look at it this way, and I'm going to give you this in close. I look at it this way. When my daughter, both of my daughters were homeschooled, Rachel and Bethany. And so when they were homeschooled, at the end, when they graduated, we had, uh, we had a graduation service for each one of them separately. They graduated different years. We had it at my brother-in-law's church. And when Rachel graduated, the Rochesters came and sang, and Dr. R. B. Olette preached the commencement service. And when Bethany graduated, the Rochester family came and sang, and Dr. Joe Arthur preached the graduation commencement. Some of my Methodist family are still in shock. 
But we sent out invitations, preacher. And so when I was at the door greeting people coming in and somebody came in that I sent an invitation out to, I didn't look at him and say, what are you doing here? Why'd you come? I knew why they were there. I invited them. I asked them to come. They were the natural result of the invitation I'd sent out. Wickedness sends out an invitation for judgment. Now let me ask you a question. Suppose you found out somebody was coming to visit you and you didn't want them to come. You weren't comfortable with them. You knew you weren't going to enjoy the visit. But for some reason, they had to come. And you're trying to think, this is not going to be good. I'm not going to be happy with this. I'm not going to enjoy this at all. But you can't stop them from coming. What could you do? Here's the only thing you could do. You could find somebody you were comfortable with and invite them to come at the same time. And it would mitigate the circumstances who would make it a lot better. We've already heard this morning, judgment isn't just coming. It's here. We can't stop it. I'll tell you what we can do. We can send out another invitation. We can humble ourselves, say, Lord, we're getting what we deserve. But would you give us what we don't deserve? Lord, we got judgment, but we sure would like to have some mercy in the midst of it. In wrath, remember mercy. wonder how much mercy God would send us if we just bow our head before him and humble ourselves say, Lord, we're right where we ought to be. But would you give us what we don't deserve? Would you give us some mercy? If you delight in mercy and the Bible says you does, what would you do? Would you be merciful to us? I wonder, I just wonder how much mercy God would give us if we'd humble ourselves. I, that crowd out there is probably not going to humble themselves, but wonder what kind of mercy we could get if this crowd in here would get on their knees before God and say, Lord, I realize I deserve what I'm getting, but I'd like to have some mercy. You're a God of mercy, merciful kindness, love. Loving mercy. In fact, I found uh, I, uh, I found a word. I found a word in Daniel chapter nine. I'd never noticed before. It's the word forgiveness says, not just forgiveness, but forgiveness says. You know what God is? He's the God of mercies and forgiveness says in the plural form. He'll call, he's got a lot of mercy. If we humble ourselves, there's no telling how much mercy God would give us in the midst of our judgment. He just looked. Looking for somebody. Maybe when the service is over today, God would say to the angels, Did you see that? Did you see that? Did you see that down in West Virginia? Did you see that family? Did you did you see that? Did you see them humble themselves before me? I think I'll just give them mercy. I think I'll be merciful. I want you to bow your heads a moment. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Somebody's coming to the piano and maybe getting a song ready. Oh, how we need the mercy of God. Now, look, listen, if you don't need mercy, just stay where you're at. But if you know how desperately you need mercy, won't you humble yourself before God this morning? Get on knees, say, Lord. You're a merciful God and we need mercy. Let's stand together. Will you stand with me? You're a merciful God and we need that mercy. Oh, God, please be merciful to us. We'll humble ourselves before you today. Oh, God, give us mercy. Give us mercy, Lord. Be to us what you are, a merciful and kind and loving God. And in wrath, remember mercy. Would there be, while we're standing, our heads are bowed and some are at the altar, would there be some this morning say, Preacher, I'm not saved. I don't know anything about God's mercy. I, I don't know the Lord. I know I'm wicked and I need help. Would you pray for me? Is there anybody like that? You lift your hand up and let me see it. Is there anybody like that? Let's pray. Father, help us now in this invitation. Help us to humble ourselves. And we pray for the mercy of a kind and merciful God. In Jesus' name, amen. Sir.